So welcome to the Weave Online User Group. If this is your first time, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Uh, this is a, um, a regular program that we've been doing now for a couple of years at our company, WeaveWorks. Uh, we've got Stacy here as one of our community managers. So she's been putting together, uh, this is our first of our 2020 spring season. So thanks for joining us for the first talk. Uh, for this season, we'll be um, bringing talks every two weeks, uh, usually Tuesday at this time, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific. Uh, if any uh, of you have other times that would work better, um, you'll get an email after this and feel free to give me any kind of feedback. Um, but for now, we've been doing these at Tuesdays at 10 a.m. and we've been bringing you a variety of topics of guest speakers like today. We are very lucky to have Lockie Evanson from Microsoft. He'll be talking about Helm 3. Um, other times we have uh, people from our developer experience team speaking on a variety of topics, uh, technologies, open source, etc. So if this is your first time, welcome. Um, I see some familiar names as well. Uh, welcome back. I hope your 2020 is going well. My name is Tamo Nakahara. Um, I run the developer experience team at Weaveworks, and uh, so thanks for joining us. I'll give you a little bit more information before we start. So a little background, so thanks for listening. If you've never heard of us before, we're a startup called WeaveWorks. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, Berlin, New York, London, and Colorado, as well as distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CTO and um, CEO are the ones who created the technology and the company around that, and they sold that to VMware. Uh, fast forward, they went through VMware, Pivotal, et cetera, and then they noticed some needs in the container space and started creating some open source uh, projects that then turned into products, uh, and then now the company uh, Weave works. Uh, we're VC funded by a variety of groups, uh, and um, one of them is Google Ventures. We mentioned that uh, among the other investors that we have because uh, it is part of our investment in the Kubernetes space. So if you haven't heard of us, uh, some of the open source projects may be familiar to you. Uh, as I mentioned, we started with some open source projects. The earliest was WeaveNet, which continues to be one of the premier projects to network your Kubernetes clusters. Um, other ones that have come along are Flux and Cortex, which are now in the CNCF. Uh, Flux, you may know, was the project that kind of led to are coining the term of GitOps, uh, which has really taken off um, a year later. In fact, I think it was at the very first Helm Summit that I went to in Portland that we had come out with our blog post in February, and I think that event was around April or May, and I was just amazed how people were just using the word GitOps, 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 as, as if it had been you know, around for years. Um, but I really think it was the strength of also um, you know, are giving a word to something that was already evolving and developing. You know, we weren't like inventing something. We um, came up with a word for it that really seemed to uh, resonate with um, a variety of practices that were going on, right? Um, and we have many, many more. Um, you might have heard of Weave Flagger, which also extends the GitOps capability by bringing things like Canary deployments and Blue Green um, to your Kubernetes usage by leveraging, um, in most cases, um, service meshes, um, but also in some cases, uh, other ways of bringing what is now increasingly being called progressive delivery. Uh, and many, many more. Um, one last thing I'll mention is EKS Cuddle is now officially the um, CLI for Amazon's EKS. Um, and it's something, again, that was built out in a developer experience team here at Weaveworks as an open source project to help people get on board with different um, Kubernetes uh, offerings out there. So, um, if you want to find out more, here are some and many, many more that we have. You can always reach out to us um, when these are all on GitHub and check them out. Uh, as a company, we also do have products. <laughs> we do try to make money. Um, our very first product uh, is called Weave Cloud, and it's now been around for a couple of years. Uh, it's a SaaS product that helps you monitor, manage, and uh, do automated deployments for your uh, Kubernetes cluster. So it brings that GitOps to it. And uh, in some ways, you could see it as a hosted versions and supported versions of some of the open source projects that we have. Uh, we've been running Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. So now we've had at least four years of experience of running Kubernetes in production. And so while we were selling Weave Cloud, we found many people who are actually saying, oh, we're really excited that you have that kind of experience. You know, is there a platform or is there support that you can provide? So now we do offer um, for pay some levels of consulting training support, um, but primarily to the now productized version of that Kubernetes layer that we created, which we now call Weave Kubernetes 
this platform. Um, so we do have a lot of different GitOps things that we do with open source, but if you want to take that to the enterprise level, you know, with teams and, and more controls, then uh, Weave Kubernetes platform is the product that uh, hopefully you can check out. So uh, again, if you've never heard of us before, welcome. Our website is weave.works. If you have more questions, uh, please check it out or email me. Thanks for joining. So with that uh, little bit of housekeeping, like I said, we are lucky to have um, Lockie Evanson here from um, Microsoft. And um, these sessions, if you've come before, usually last between about 30 to 45 minutes. So they could be as short as 30, um, generally have around 45. And if you guys have burning questions, as I would expect you would for Lockie, uh, we will go over, but we have a hard, hard stop at the end of the hour, so 60 minutes. We are using a platform called Zoom. Um, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, please try to find the chat box, which is usually with a button on the left corner of your screen. Um, that will be the way for you to ask questions. So if you have any questions, please um, ask it there. Um, make sure that you uh, ask your questions to all panelists and attendees. Uh, so that way everybody can see your question. Uh, a lot of times people get into helping each other and answering each other's questions too. So make sure you've definitely chosen all panelists and attendees because otherwise people won't be able to see your answers. Um, if you have any trouble finding the chat button, uh, hitting escape will get you out of full screen mode. Sometimes that helps to find that. So thanks for listening to that. And with that, I will hand it over to Lucky. We'll stop sharing. And Lucky, I think you should be able to okay, take wonderful. over. Wonderful, I will start sharing. And do the obligatory, can you see my screen? I assume everybody can? Yes, you can, yes we okay, can. Okay, fantastic. Hello, my name's Lockie Evenson, and I just first of all would like to start by saying thank you to Weaveworks for hosting me today. Excited to be here and tell you all about Helm 3. We're gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of what Helm is, go into what Helm 3 is, and how to use Helm 3, and also share some tips and tricks on how to actually have a better experience with Helm. So let's dive into it. So first of all, as I mentioned, we're gonna go into uh, why Helm, what Helm is, um, what it sets out to achieve in the community um, with, uh, in the Kubernetes ecosystem. We're gonna take a look at a new version of Helm um, called Helm 3. We're gonna look at how that's different to Helm 2, which has uh, been the latest stable release for uh, the last few years. Uh, look at the breaking changes, some exciting new features, and then talk about how you can use Helm more reliably um, in your situation. And then we'll finally wrap up uh, with what's next and how you can get more engaged with the Helm community. First of all, a little introduction to who I am and who's speaking to you and telling you about Helm. My name's Lachlan Evenson. Um, I'm an open source program manager at Azure. So I take care of uh, projects in predominantly the cloud native ecosystem, things like Kubernetes, container runtimes, uh, application developer tooling such as Helm, uh, things that we take care of in the open source realm. I'm one of the Helm charts maintainers and have been for several years. So the upstream uh, Helm charts repo, you may have installed something from that before. Uh, I work on the team there that helps create a great experience for the Helm upstream charts. So um, if you have any questions on chart authoring, feel free to ask them today or you can reach me um, afterwards as well. Also served as uh, the Kubernetes release lead. So um, that's the person responsible for building a Kubernetes release and shipping it out to the public. I did that for release 116. Um, and I serve as a, a CNCF ambassador, which is to say I go around helping people use these tools and understand uh, what they do and how you can use them. So Helm. Helm is coined as the package manager for Kubernetes. And when we think about package managers, you might think in the world of Linux or even using your Mac every day, uh, apt or yum or brew, uh, things that might come to mind. So Helm is basically a very similar idea. So let's take an application and install it on Kubernetes. So Helm sets out to solve that problem. How do we actually talk about applications and upgrade and roll back and uh, take care of all the care and feeding for your applications. So what does Helm have in it? So you can find, uh, discover, 
different applications. So for example, you might want to install um, the Nginx ingress controller, which is a common tool that's installed on many Kubernetes clusters. You would be able to find and install that um, to your cluster with one command. Uh, we also allow easy updates. So from there, you install an Nginx ingress controller, you can update it as the chart, which is what we call the package in Helm terms, uh, can be updated and rolled back. So we not only help define your application, but help you have operational analogs for that up, um, application. For example, upgrades, rollbacks. Uh, we then allow you to create um, your package and share it so that other people might uh, want to have access to that package and share and install it on their clusters and as I said um, operational analogs. So all these things are under the umbrella of Helm and um, help people deploy their applications to Kubernetes. Now I'm going to take a look at Helm 3 specifically as this is the latest stable release of Helm and we're going to take a look at how that's different, what's new about it and why the community is really excited about it. Uh, First of all, Helm 3 is the culmination of many years of uh, usage of Helm in the ecosystem. So Helm was originally released around uh, September in 2016, I believe. Um, so it's had several years of maturity in the um, cloud native ecosystem. And Helm 3 was a look at all the usage out there of Helm 2 um, and a retake on how we might want to do things better as a community to make Helm a future-proof tool uh, that's usable in the ecosystem as it stands today. So we took all the community feedback and basically created Helm 3. I'm going to share that feedback. Uh, dramatic simplification. So it's not often that an open source project is happy to delete thousands of lines of code, uh, but that's what actually happened in Helm 3. Large chunks of code were deleted, but we didn't remove functionality. We simplified functionality um, to create better security analogs, and I'll dive into them soon. And then architectural changes. So Kubernetes obviously releases every three months. Helm was released when Kubernetes was 1.0. It's now 1.17 is the latest stable release. So as Kubernetes has changed, the way people use Kubernetes is also changing, and Helm needs to keep up with the way people are using Kubernetes. So um, that security posture has been a priority. So let's dive into specific things that we did when we built um, Helm 3. And we, I mean the royal we of the Helm community. I only showed up as a, a chart maintainer. So there are uh, uh, several uh, people from the community building Helm and a wide community of people using Helm. So when I say we, I don't mean me, only me personally. There are a large number of people involved in creating Helm and thank you to all of them. So the major refactor that we actually needed, so Helm is as old as Kubernetes, and it predated a lot of the security analogs and extensibility analogs that we have today. So imagine Kubernetes without RBAC, without CRDs, um, even without deployments or ingresses. That's the world that Helm was brought into the ecosystem with. And now obviously all these things exist. So how do we take care and incorporate all these features and security features in Kubernetes and use them to create a better experience via Helm? So Helm was Helm 3 was goal was specifically make it simple, more secure and focus on production. <clears throat> so what we heard from the community was Helm is great, but I cannot use it in production because of reasons X, Y, and Z. And most of those reasons were security concerns of the posture of Helm. So making Kubernetes, um, Helm more Kubernetes native. So we wanted to inherit most of the security analogs from Kubernetes rather than reinvent them in the Helm layer themselves. So we used kubeconfig as a source of identity and security control. So who are you and what access do you have? We've now inherited from uh, kubeconfig, which is a common way that people interact with the Kubernetes cluster with tools like kube control. Uh, we've also uh, used RBAC as a way to limit access to resources. So Security-wise, Helm 2 was typically deployed with essentially God mode credentials, so it could do anything to a cluster and hence was a security concern. With Helm 3, we've removed that and said whatever security um, limit 
an access that a specific user has, we will use to uh, deploy your application. And we've replaced custom APIs um, with deployments and secrets. And so we're, we're using more Kubernetes native tooling um, rather than re-implementing it at Helm. Now, as I said, when Helm was created, these things didn't exist in Kubernetes. So this is a very natural evolution for Helm to use those pieces of Kubernetes. So I, I don't think I've heard a louder roar in a KubeCon keynote than when uh, it was announced that Tiller was going to be removed from Helm. Um, Tiller was a server side component that was introduced in Helm 2 that was really uh, responsible for doing everything on behalf of the user, which back in the early days of Kubernetes was a common pattern. Uh, but as the security analogs have evolved, that is no longer um, best practices to have a, a cluster admin level component running in cluster that can do anything to your cluster. But with this, we've simplified the code. Uh, so Helm is gone. We now no longer have a server side component that was responsible for installing things on your cluster. We can now interact with the Kubernetes API directly using your cube config file and your access credentials. Everything that used to be um, handled server side is now moved client side. So the rendering of charts, again, a chart is the name of the packaging format for Helm. Um, the storing of a release, everything happens um, client side rather than server side. And this is also great because now anybody can use Helm and they don't need a cluster admin to install the server side component to take those requests. You can use Helm limited to only your namespace and only have the impact that you're allowed to have on that cluster rather than inheriting the posture of a global admin. So Tiller is gone and that is the single most biggest change to Helm 3. And that was um, based on feedback to everybody saying, I love Helm, but I don't love Tiller. So it was natural for us to remove Tiller. Now, the CLI has changed a lot as well. Now, this was based on making it more Kubernetes native. So we picked up operational verbs from Kubernetes and standardized based on people's experiences with kube control specifically. Um, so a lot of the verbs, so Helm delete has become Helm uninstall, Helm inspect, Helm show, Helm fetch. All these have an analog from Helm 2 to Helm 3. Uh, but the interesting thing is that they're all alias now. So the idea of Helm 3 was also not to break any existing tooling that people had and you could drop in with very minimal reconfiguration, Helm 2, um, the Helm 2 binary with the Helm 3 binary and perform an upgrade. So while there are new, whilst there are new verbs there, um, we actually alias the old commands so that they still work as people transition from Helm 2 to Helm 3. Also a note down there, purge is now default. That used to be an optional value, which means we remove um, the release configuration from the cluster. So uh, a deployed application, we used to store the metadata by default, even after you deleted, now we delete it by default. Okay, so we're gonna take a look at breaking changes, which is always a fun uh, conversation. But before I go into that, the goal of going to Helm 2 uh, from Helm 2 to Helm 3 was to create a journey that the community could go on with very minimal breaking changes. So I will go through things that you need to be aware of, but the idea is any tooling that you are using in Helm 2 should be forwards compatible with Helm 3, um, at least while they both exist in the ecosystem. So keep that in mind and I'll, I'll give you a call to action if you find any um, places where that is not true. Um, and as I mentioned, there is an FAQ here, which details all these changes that I'm um, listing. So uh, we intend to support Helm 2 charts. So don't worry, you don't have to go and rewrite all your charts. Um, you should be able to replace the Helm 2 binary with the Helm 3 binary if you take all these considerations into account. So namespace changes. In Helm 2, when you install an application, it would create the namespace on your behalf if you asked it to. So let me give you an example. If you did helm install dash dash namespace um, locky, helm would actually create the namespace on Kubernetes called locky before installing the application um, into that um, namespace. 
Now we found that generally this isn't best practice in Kubernetes to create things on behalf of the user. Uh, Kubernetes is all about declaration and intent with that declaration. So if a namespace isn't created, you will get an error. Um, I have a demo soon that will show you this behavior. So you need to actually create the namespace using whatever tooling you have before you can install a chart into that namespace. Um, also some other pieces with namespaces, the release metadata is stored in the namespace that you install it. So if you're installing Nginx ingress into the namespace called Locky, the release, which is the installation details of that chart are now stored as a secret in that namespace. That is a behavioral difference to Helm 2. Helm 2 actually stored them in the same namespace as the Tiller component, which was that service comp side component that has now actually been removed in Helm 3. Um, so the last piece here is templated resources. So if you actually define dash dash namespace on your Helm install, it will actually make sure that all those resources are installed to that namespace that you provide as part of your install command. So that's it with namespace changes. Chart dependency management, this is a big one. Um, so chart dependency is I have a chart, let's say um, WordPress that depends on Postgres in the background. So you can actually put a dependency and say this WordPress depends on this specific chart or this package of Postgres. So that when you install WordPress, it will install the dependencies as part of the installation. So it'll install the Postgres database and configure WordPress to talk to that database. Now, the way that these were configured in Helm 2 was via this file in the chart called requirements.yaml. We've moved um, dependencies directly into the chart.yaml and chart.lock. So um, this, if you use Helm 3 and you have dependencies, they will still work. Um, but if you use dependency subcommands, which is to create new dependencies or update to compete dependencies, you'll need to migrate um, those dependencies into the chart.yaml rather than the requirements.yaml. And I will mention some tooling that helps with this soon. CRD installation, so custom resources. So let's talk about Prometheus. If you want to install the Prometheus operator using Helm, it will define some custom resources that are inherent to that um, Prometheus chart, Prometheus operator chart. Now, the, the way that these were described in Helm 2 was you would put them in the templated um, resources directory, but now you actually put them in a CRDs directory. So over on the right, you see that I have a chart called crontabs. In the root of that directory, I have a chart.yaml and I have a directory called CRDs. So there is a crontab.yaml. All your CRDs need to be moved under that subdirectory um, under the chart. So if you have CRDs and you are a chart author, you need to move them over. If you're not a chart author and you're just a chart user, the chart maintainer should update this on your behalf and there should be no action for you. Um, the other thing that we do not do anymore is actually delete CRDs because we couldn't determine whether other things were using them. So we wanted to play it safe. So after you install some CRDs and if you delete the Prometheus operator, the CRDs will remain on that cluster for a cluster admin to remove. As I said, in the interest of safety, we can't guarantee that other things aren't using those CRDs and leaving orphan resources around is never a good thing. Release metadata. So the release metadata is now stored um, in a secret in the, the same namespace as the release. So if you were to do a Helm install Nginx, Nginx ingress in the default namespace, you would see that there is a secret in there that stores the metadata. So this allows different users to actually interrogate what software is released via Helm in each um, namespace is done by interrogating the secrets in Kubernetes. The interesting thing here is if you have a cluster with um, Helm releases on it from Helm 2 and you want to move to Helm 3, they're not backwards compatible. So there is a tool that the upstream Helm community has published, which will take Helm 2 releases and upgrade them to Helm 3. 
so that you can move um, released software. So again, this is only the case where you have something running, you used Helm 2, you want to upgrade to Helm 3, and you want that software that's already installed on your Kubernetes to be picked up um, via Helm 3. Uh, one final one is uh, a deprecated function that we have. So uh, a lot of people use release.time. We actually deprecated that in favor for the now function as it's more configurable to give you different timing options based on what your needs are. Uh, generate name. So in Helm 2, we would actually generate a release name, uh, which would be those quirky little names of like a, a really cool ad adjective and a noun or something along those lines. In Helm 3, again, uh, along the lines of what you're doing in uh, Kube Control and what your expectations are at Kubernetes, unless you ask it to do something, we're not going to do it on your behalf. So the generate name flag is now the, uh, you need to supply a flag for it to generate a release name. Okay, so I have a demo here. We'll see how it goes. I'm gonna talk through it, it's, it's recorded, um, but this should give you an end-to-end -end what Helm 3 looks like. The thing I want you to take away from this is if you're not new, if you're new to Helm and you've never used it before, um, you can see the simplicity of the flow. Search, install, find what you need, install it, and then delete it. If you're familiar with Helm 2, I'm going to show you how much different Helm 3 looks. And, you know, spoiler alert, not different at all. Um, but I'm going to show you some things under the hood as well. So let me get into it here. Okay. So here I'm going to show you a Kubernetes version. I have a 1.16 cluster here up and running. We're going to do a Helm version. So you can see that I'm using Helm V3 RC3. And we're going to do a list. So here's the upstream stable repo where I can search. So I'm going to install a WordPress chart from the stable upstream repo and give it a release name of WordPress. So with one command, I'm installing WordPress to this Kubernetes cluster. It gives me some details of where it's installed, um, some notes on how to access it. But with one command, I've installed WordPress to a cluster. Now I'm going to get the pods. We can see we've got a MariaDB and a WordPress pod there. And I'm going to do a Helm LS, which shows that I have WordPress installed. Here's the release metadata, Kube control get secret. That's where it's stored on the cluster. And I'm going to take a look at that really quickly to show you the contents of that secret. So you can see that there's one big JSON blob that you could decode. Um, it's base 64 encoded to see the release details. Here again is that WordPress chart that's installed. Now I'm actually going to use the Nginx ingress controller and install that in a specific namespace. So I'm going to install it in the namespace called nginx-ingress, again from the stable upstream chart. Now that behavior, I cannot create a namespace. So I need to create that namespace before I can install it. So I've created the namespace there. Now I'm going to run the install again. We should see that that succeeds. That's demonstrating the behavioral difference in Helm 3. So that is the Helm 2 chart that was created. I'm using Helm 3 to install it from the upstream repo. And now we can take a look at the pods in that namespace to see that I indeed have an Nginx ingress controller and a default backend. Now, if I list it and do not specify a namespace, I can only see the current namespace that I'm working in. I can give it dash dash all namespaces, in which case I see the Nginx release. And then I can do one specific to a namespace by supplying it. This will show that Nginx is there. Finally, I'm going to delete this. I can't delete it because I didn't give it a namespace. And voila, I've now deleted the Nginx ingress from that namespace. I'm also gonna delete WordPress from the default namespace and WordPress is now uninstalled. We can also take a look that there is no release metadata by getting secrets, demonstrating that the purge is there and that WordPress has indeed been uninstalled. So that's a whirlwind tour of Helm 3. Again, if you're familiar with Helm, it's not that much different. Um, for those new to it, you can see that we can install something really quickly. 
Okay, so now we're going to take a look at some features of Helm 3, um, some new exciting features. So chart repository API. So I mentioned sh the sharing of charts. In Helm 2, charts were stored in a chart repository, which was uh, um, uh, a web server that generate, that you use some tooling in Helm to actually generate those artifacts that are stored. Now, this was complicated for people to use, and I don't think many people in the community liked the fact that they needed to maintain another repository alongside their container repository. So in that vein, we've created an experimental flag right now where you can store your Helm charts in a container repository, meaning that you can use the same place that you're storing your container images to serve up Helm charts as well. And this, the net effect here is if you're working for a business and you want to publish your own chart, you can store that in uh, your container repository and then another set of developers can actually install that chart. Okay, uh, the chart API. So charts again is the packaging mechanism. I see, are there any questions coming in? I see some chats lighting up here. Um, not right now. Not right now? Okay. Um, uh, sorry, and someone was asking, uh, yes, do please uh, ask your questions here in the uh, chat box. Make sure you choose all panelists and attendees. Um, and I also did get a comment that I guess the demo was a little fast, but maybe we'll uh, Maybe we'll go through questions later. We could kind of run through the demo again if people feel like they missed something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my apologies for going super fast there. I can certainly slow it down and, and share bits of it again. Uh, so back to the Helm API version two. So the chart is the definition of your application. Um, now there is a new chart version as well. Uh, the changes are minimal and it's mainly to help tooling in the ecosystem. Uh, for example, there's a Helm operator in the Flux project to identify different uh, versions of Helm that have been used to create the charts. Uh, some dependency changes and there are also library charts. So I'll talk about library charts momentarily. Uh, so library charts in Helm, you template your applications um, and then you insert values into those templated resources that are essentially just templated Kubernetes resources. One thing that was complex in Helm 2 was if there are pieces of Kubernetes resources or common pieces such as, let's say you have some standard labeling across your business, you want all Kubernetes resources to be labeled with component, um, department, location, pieces of information like that. In Helm 2, you'd have to replicate all that in every chart that you actually own and store. In Helm 3, we have the concept of library charts where you can have templated pieces that can be reused and inserted. The net effect here is if, you know, if your IT department comes along and says, we have a new set of standard labels, instead of going changing every chart that has those labels, you can have one library chart that has your labels and you can inherit the labels from that chart. So library charts allow you to define elements that are reused, reusable, and it allows you to not have to copy and paste so much between reusable bits of charts. Validating charts values with JSON schema. So values are actually the things that are in, uh, inserted into the templated resources. Now in Helm 2, you had no um, way to type these values or understand defaults or set different ranges of values. So in Helm 3, they've introduced um, a JSON schema that you can ship with your chart, which allows um, users to actually get really early feedback on typing. Um, and what I mean by typing is, let's say you try to put the value in as a string and it's actually expecting an integer, you can throw an error really uh, early rather than having Helm try to release that invalid template to Kubernetes. Um, so it allows for better error reporting. The other thing that I've seen this used in is you could ingest this in a web UI. So if you wanna create a user experience for Helm where you have an install via a web UI, you could actually preset the defaults and give either drop down menus or you can say uh, this is the default value. So you can see here over on the right, uh, we have a property called image. It's a container image and it's repo type string and a tag of string. So you could set these up um, 
if you're a chart maintainer to make sure that people don't insert invalid values into your application. So just a, a larger view of that and my favorite little JSON happy, <laughs> happy image there. So um, that hopefully makes it clear. And there are some charts out there and on the FAQ that show you how to do this if you're a chart maintainer or interested in having this functionality. Three-way merge for upgrade. Again, this is a, a change in behavior from Helm 2. So Helm 2 actually would take a look at the old config and the new config in the context of Helm, but would disregard the current state of what was going on in Kubernetes. Now this meant if somebody had manually changed things on a cluster after you'd done a release to your software, it would not be considered as part of that change. Now in Helm 3, uh, we do a three-way merge, which means we consider the current state on the cluster. And that just again gives you some default behavior uh, that you understand that's very similar to cube control apply. So that's it with the uh, new exciting features in Helm 3. The, the final bit I'm going to go over here before moving on to how you can get plugged in is just increasing the probability that you will have success in using Helm. So I'm going to share some tooling, some open source tooling out there to help you have a better experience with Helm. One of the challenges with the removal of Tiller is you're now using charts to deploy things um, that you have access to and charts may define things that you cannot touch in a Kubernetes cluster. So using these pre-release checks, we can determine if we're going to cause an error upon install of these applications really early. Excellent. I was wondering if this is a good time to pause for yeah. a list of questions that we got from yes. one person. Go, go for it. Um, all right. And then you can decide if it's more appropriate. Uh, first one, what version of Helm 3 will have the generic Lua templating for charts? So Helm 3, uh, good question. Generic uh, Lua templating was dropped from Helm 3 in its entirety at the moment. So it was touted very early. Um, but the community made a decision that it was not a critical punk piece of functionality to ship in Helm 3. So therefore, Lua is not in Helm 3. And uh, Archie says, rip Lua. Uh, rip Lua, yes. <laughs> rip, rip Lua, rest in peace. Um, okay, great, good answer. Um, number two, how are the new library charts different from the previous method, which was just to use generic common charts with templates? Yeah, so library charts are different in that, you know, I kind of think of them as library code in terms of you don't really have a main function. And the main function analog to Helm is I don't actually install uh, resources onto a Kubernetes cl cluster or template a complete resource. So it's basically blocks that you can say insert this block from a library into here. Um, so Again, it doesn't actually, a library chart doesn't install anything. It's just blocks that can be inserted at random into charts that import that specific library. Again, the main usage is if you want to have some common, let's say you're using, I don't know, pod security policies and you had pod security policies that ship with your all your application and you want to make one change to the way that they're defined because you have a standard way to do that. You now can do that in one place in the library chart rather than changing it in n number of charts that you have. And then each chart would inherit that. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, third question. What will happen to the official stable repository? I've heard that it won't be available sometime in 2020. Yeah, so what this question is referring to is there has been a community-based stable repo, and that's where we installed Nginx Ingress and WordPress from. Um, what we're moving to is Helm Hub. And what Helm Hub allows people to do is to ship their own and maintain their own application chart. So specifically, if I was a company and I had a chart, let's just say I'm the maintainer of Prometheus, I'd have to put it in the upstream Helm um, repository and that would have to go through a bunch of maintainers to make sure that that is actually correct. Now me as a Helm chart maintainer, I may have no knowledge of the best practices to install Prometheus. So why am I getting in the way of actually that process happening? So we're delegating it out to each maintainer to be able to bring their own charts repository and then aggregating them into Helm hub so that um, you know each constituent of Helm hub is responsible for maintaining their own charts 
rather than having a central body saying that this is how you must do your charts. So we find that that works uh, better in two cases. One, company shipping software via Helm uh, incentivized to do a better job to create a great experience than me personally standing in the way of that. Um, and also it allows them to bring their own repositories that they are sovereign over so they can release software at their own cadence rather than getting roadblocked by a single upstream repo. So if you go to hub.helm.sh, um, you can actually add via your own PR, your own repository. So if you're in the business of shipping your own software, you can add your own repository, then it will be searchable via that central Helm hub. Excellent. And the last question that we have here is, is the three-way merge going to be improved in the later version? The reason I ask is that I tried to upgrade two clusters using Helm v302 and received many errors. And we pasted in the error, um, the issues here. Um, these errors were related to parts of the Kubernetes manifest being immutable. Uh, and so uh, this was why I was thinking this was related to the three-way merge functionality. Yeah, so um, the answer is yes, if you make it known that there is a problem. So I would uh, ask that you bring the exact details of the problem. I understand that they're pasted in there. So you can either reach me directly uh, at Locky83 on the Kubernetes um, uh, Slack channel, and we can either work out how to raise an issue together, or you can raise an issue and we can bring it to the attention of the community. But again, you know, I, I thank you for bringing this up. We want to make those things better. So if you have actual use cases, please present them and we'll take a look at it and see how we can make it better for you. So thanks for bringing that to my attention. Great. Um, I, actually, going back to the previous uh, conversation, Archie sure. was adding, uh, how do you choose the quote unquote correct or the most official chart in the Helm hub? Um, is there any rule of thumb? Yeah. So, um, I would say, you know, my rule of thumb when I'm example, selecting them is... For example, you know, Nginx, he says. Nginx. So, yeah, um, Nginx is a little bit more of a tricky one if there's no company that's clearly backing it or maintaining it. Um, but I would use the same rule of thumb as container images. So if you're grabbing Ubuntu as a base image, you're probably going to want to grab that from Canonical, not Lockie Evenson. Um, just as a as an eye as a rule of thumb. So if there are clear threads of maintainership from a from an entity, obviously make sure that they're maintaining that and use that as your rule of thumb is what would be the most official and blessed. Again, this is was the theory behind Helm Hub. Um, but obviously you can go and find Prometheus in a million containers on Docker Hub as well. And one is the official up, upstream container uh, maintain one and the rest are people just doing their own thing. So I would use that as your rule of thumb. Is it published by the maintainer of that project or product? Makes sense. Thanks everybody. Um, oh, and someone also shared, uh, I'll, I'll paste it um, to everyone. Uh, someone shared some, some guidelines. Um, so with that, yes. Please. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep going and I'll try and speed it up so we can get some more questions at the end. But again, we're just looking at how we can make releases of your Helm charts more reliable. Um, so here are the top three ways Helm releases fail. Uh, invalid Kubernetes resources. So you render a Kubernetes resource that is not valid at all. Uh, denied by policy. This is a big one with things like pod security policy or OPA as more people are using. So you want to get ahead of that. And then obviously invalid role based access control in terms of I might be trying to install a resource that I can't install or modify. So let me share some tools really quickly of how you can do this. So it, I have the bits that you need to pay attention to bold, but you can see that this is really horrible, this error message. So here what I'm doing is trying to install the Nginx chart and I'm setting a value of controller.replica count to the string of two. Now clearly this is invalid, but the error message is actually not that clear as to why this doesn't work. If I looked at this and I have very minimal knowledge of how to debug this, uh, cannot be handled as a deployment error found in, you know, number 10 byte. Not really useful. So how can we make this more useful? We could um, 
actually use some tooling out there to make sure that this works. Now, this one is another invalid resource. If you're using Kubernetes 1.16 or moving to it, obviously deprecated APIs are a big problem there. So this is demonstrating, you can't install this chart because this API version does not exist. And I um, share the blog down there for API deprecation. So here's two use cases for resources are invalid or they don't work. So here is a tool called Cubaval. Um, you can go ahead and use Helm, the Helm plugin mechanism to install it. Um, and a uh, hat tip to Gareth there, who's been working on this tool. Let's see it in situation. So I'm gonna run, instead of that Helm install that I ran on the sl two slides ago, I'm now running a Helm Cubaval. And what this is gonna give me, uh, you know, with the same settings, it's gonna give me a more manageable error message. So we see there that I have an invalid type on spec replicas. I expected to get an integer, you gave me a string. So again, if you're using um, tools like Flux or CICD pipelines to deploy, you could actually put these in path and make sure that you're actually deploying valid resources before they're pushed to Kubernetes and Kubernetes gives you an error. So again, Kubaval, you can actually pull release versions from the upstream uh, open API schemas as well. So we're here we can say that I want to check that Nginx Ingress is installing valid resources as per Kubernetes 1.15. And then it'll go through and say, yes, this is a valid service account. This is a valid deployment. This is a valid, or this is invalid. So that's one tool, Kubaval, keep that in mind. It's open source, you can install it and you can put this as your pre-validation checks in your pipelines. Okay, ConfTest. ConfTest basically takes OPI, OPA back policy. So you can re write uh, open uh, policy agent policy and say, let's say everything needs to have a memory limit set. So using ConfTest, we can use a policy library here to say, hang on, there's no memory limit set. There's no CPU limit set. I'm going to error. And I know that I want these things set because there's actually an admission webhook server side that says that I'm not going to allow any resources that don't have these set. Again, we're trying to bring these failures back client side so you can have a better experience and pre-detect before you push invalid resources to a Kubernetes cluster. So let's take a look at that. I'm now going to set the limits here. Uh, the memory and the CPU limits, and I don't actually get an error at all. It just returns zero, that command, and says that this is valid based on the policy. So ConfTest is also installable as a Helm plugin. It's a really cool tool if you're using policy and it allows you to write generic policy to say that your resources must look like this. If you're using tools like Gatekeeper, which do um, OPA-based policy server side, you can bring that policy back over and reuse it client side as well. Um, and a uh, final piece of this is RBAC. So in Helm 3, uh, you don't have cluster admin anymore. So a lot of people are relying on that behavior to actually install things. Without that behavior, you're gonna have things fail in different ways. So here's a way I've put together this horrible bash command, but um, you could use a tool or build a tool like this using the cube control can I API. What the cube control can I API says is, it makes an API call on behalf of a specific user and says, can I do this action? And it'll give you a yes or no. Now, for those of you who aren't willing to read all this bash or aren't interested in understanding what it does, it actually takes a Helm um, chart, creates all the resources and then runs it by this cube control, can I API? And then the net effect is, uh, can I create a cluster role um, down here? So the answer is no, I can't create a cluster role. I can't create a cluster role binding um, as my user, but I can create a deployment, a role, a role binding, a service account. So if I was to install this chart, it would fail with my current user credentials because I can't create cluster roles and cluster role binding. So again, some tooling that you can use to help make your Helm charts successfully install. Um, so here are some um, references. Cube control, auth, can I, and also who can, which is using the uh, crew plugin method in cube control. So you can use those interfaces to actually check can a user create or modify these resources based on their RBAC credentials. Okay, moving on to what's next.
did we want to pause and take any questions there? Sorry, we just have one question, but you said it could wait till the end. Okay. We are, we, we have 10 minutes left. So yeah. Okay. I'm going to power through this quickly so we can uh, have some time for questions. So what's next? So Helm is in the incubating state in the CNCF um, maturity model. Uh, they performed the security audit last year, late last year, and are primed to go to graduated state. So just for everybody's knowledge, people are interested in using Helm in production. There is the audit report there published as a PDF. So if you're considering Helm in your workplace, you can have a look at that. Uh, no major vulnerabilities found. There was one very minor vulnerability that's been patched. So Helm's got a clean rap sheet. Uh, in the, in the uh, CNCF ecosystem, Helm has continuously been the third most popular um, project out there at the moment, um, only, only third to Kubernetes and Prometheus. So there's a lot of high interest in Helm. It's got large community adoption. Um, so if you're considering Helm, you might want to take a look at the security audit and it will be graduated, no doubt, very soon. Um, if you're using Helm 2, what's Helm 3 mean to you? The upstream uh, maintainers are going to maintain six months of bug fixes and security issues for Helm 2 and then a 12 month EOL on Helm 2. So it's early days for Helm 3. It's been out since November last year. Um, but uh, we're urging everybody to go to Helm 3 where they find time this year so that at the end of the year when they EOL Helm 2, most of the community and tooling is based on Helm 3. If you'd like to get involved, you can check out the docs, upgrade to Helm 3 and start using it. Obviously the binary compatibility should be there um, with sharp edges as we've heard on this call. So if you have any sharp edges, raise those issues. Um, there are community calls as well, but for the folks out here that are using Helm in anger in production and are having issues with Helm 3, we certainly wanna hear them. Don't assume that we know about things. Feel free to show up um, and raise your issues and we can create better pathways for that tooling. We had one mentioned with the three-way merge, that's new functionality, things are breaking, let's get that um, looked at and make sure we have a reasonable solution for people who are using it. Uh, and thank you very much. You can check out all the docs online and you can find me at Lockie83 on the Kubernetes Slack if you have any questions. And I, this deck will be posted as well, so you can flick through it at your own leisure. Thank you, that's great, thanks so much. Um, so we have the question that we had uh, for the end was um, this is regarding the previous Lua conversation since Lua templating won't be implemented in your opinion what's the most dry way to create a plethora of helm charts for example JSON is used to generate JSON and YAML um, using reusable blocks are helm v3 library charts sort of like JSON it but for helm yeah so they are sort of like JSON it for helm I think you know I'd have to pull up different places where I've seen this, but a lot of tools customize as one tool, JSON it as another. And Helm 3 allows you to plug these things together a lot more seamlessly so that you can say, well, you know, I'm going to delegate this bit to customize because I like the way customize uses this. So let me see if I can dig them up and maybe I tweet them out um, or ping me if you're interested in, in following up on that, because I know that I have seen some people using JSON it customized with Helm 3 and the feedback that I've seen in there is it's a lot more amenable to that than Helm 2 was. Interesting. Well, thank you. Um, so we have five minutes left. Um, are there any last questions or um, kind of to the previous comment that the demo part maybe went a little more quickly uh, than maybe people could follow? Is there anything specific to the demo? Craig says it's fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, and of course, yes, I've, I've posted that um, if, if you're new to, um, uh, to this Weave user group, uh, everything that we uh, have from the last many years since we started is all posted to the WeWorks YouTube channel, which uh, I've pasted in the chat and you will also get that link in um, your follow-up email. Um, we do have another question. Um, are there examples of new library charts somewhere? Yes, in the FAQ, there are some references to library charts. Uh, again, I don't have the link offhand, but feel free to ping me on Slack and I'll get you the link for referencing library charts. Excellent. 
Um, uh, so yeah, so as I was saying, if, uh, if you guys want to review anything, you will get the links to this and definitely yeah, share with, with anybody else who'd like to watch. And um, Lockie, can you remind us again, where will you be posting your slides? Um, I can post them on SlideShare, so I'll give you a, a link and I'll also send them to you if you'd like to post them somewhere as well. Yes, and uh, we can include them in the uh, email that we'll send everybody who's attending here. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so I will switch over to my closing slides. Um, oh, uh, Lockie or Stacy, can you um, unshare? I unshared. There okay. you go. And I do see a question, so I will go to that. Let me just uh, I can open these for our closing remarks. Present. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, like I said, we have Stacy here who's been working very hard at uh, populating our calendar. I think we have one more there in February. So, um, you should come to our meetup group. These are the ways that you can reach out to us. If this is your first time, um, meetup.com, the Weave user group, is the single source of truth. That's the best place to be up to date on our calendar of future talks. Um, so, let me make sure everybody's seen this. Uh, so Archie asks, um, Helm file is a very popular tool to wrap Helm. Do you know if anything works? Uh, do you know if anything in there worked with Helm 3, like around Helm file? I do not know. I will follow up with um, Archie on that. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, so, uh, as we mentioned, uh, so anything here on this um, slide, uh, um, sorry, Lockie will be on Kubernetes Slack if you have any questions. Um, if you have any questions, for example, you use the open source projects that we mentioned, Flux. Uh, well, Flux is on the CNCF Slack now, but we do still have a channel where people do ask questions about Flux, Flux, on, um, Flux on our Slack channel. Uh, Flagger, WeaveNet, et cetera, any of those, um, if you use those, um, this is the uh, link to join our Slack channel. And uh, with that, I think we will wrap up. So thank you so much to Lockie for coming and speaking. Thanks for all of you for joining. Uh, it's great to see a lot of the new people and um, old, old friends. Um, if you'd like to come to any future events, like I said, sign up for our meetup page and we will follow up with all of you uh, with an email with these relevant links. It will come from me. So if anything comes up later, then feel free to ask me. Thanks again. I'll see you all next time. Thanks, Lockie. Bye-bye.